speak for about 15 minutes each. If you have questions, please pop them into the chat and then we'll cover them if we have time. And then Dan will be covering um, um, various areas and reading and interpreting ECGs from two o'clock onwards. Uh, so without any further ado, I will hand over to Payam. Thank you. Great, thank you, Sally Ann. Um, so my name is Payal Tarabi. I'm a GP in um, North Southwark, um, and I also work with Clinical Effectiveness Southwark. Um, so I'll be talking about AF. Um, if you do have any questions, do feel free to put them in the chat. If there's time at the end, I will answer them, but otherwise we will collate them um, and try and get answers out um, later on. Um, so. Just to start with, I was just going to go through a case, um, and this is actually quite similar to a case that was raised by the MDU in one of their bulletins um, last year. Um, so this is James, he's a 75 year old man who's recently retired um, and he has known but well controlled high blood pressure and obesity. And he regularly attends his GP practice for hypertension reviews and his flu jab, but not much else. Um, and he mentioned in June 2020 in passing at the end of an appointment that he was sometimes getting palpitations and so his GP arranged um, for an ECG but he never attended that appointment and then in April this year James was admitted with a stroke and was found on admission to have atrial fibrillation so a potentially preventable stroke and so I just wanted to share that case because I think we all know why we're interested in AF, but helpful to just think about a, a, a specific case. And there have been a number of changes and the NICE guidelines were, were released early hours of this morning. So I've, um, I've, I've tried to incorporate some of those um, changes from the NICE guidelines into today's presentation. Um, but there are some other key changes as well that I wanted to mention in this presentation, including around rate control, around using EMIS um, for um, your DOAC prescriptions and around weight loss in AF as well. So quickly some statistics. So we know that AF affects up to about 1% of the population and there's about a 10% prevalence in the over 85s. It increases your stroke risk by about fivefold. And we could prevent about 25 strokes per year in Southwark alone um, by, by um, acting early with AF. And there's a London vision for AF, which is that we detect 85% of the expected population with AF um, through making sure that we have good diagnostic capability. And some of you will already be aware about various screening programmes as well, which have been done in parts of South London. Protect, um, so aiming to have a high proportion of patients um, anticoagulated and making sure that they are within that anticoag um, range as well, which is, I think, a lot easier with the DOACs. And so I just wanted to share the data because I think there's a really good story here, which is that actually across South London, there's been huge improvements in the proportion of patients who are correctly anticoagulated um, in AF. Um, and this is just some data going from 2015 through to 2018, which is when the bulk of the improvements happened. A lot of that through the work that Helen Williams and others did um, in, in um, treatments of AF and supporting practices and to, to improve the care of their patients with AF. So I think there's a real good news story there with AF in terms of the treatment that we provide to our patients and the strokes that we're preventing. So next, I wanted to just talk a bit about one of the changes to the guidance, which is around rate control. And so I just wanted everyone to think for a moment about um, what their target would be for, for James if he'd visited um, your surgery after a diagnosis with AF and assuming he was already correctly anticoagulated. So if you could think about what your target heart rate would be um, in, in someone with atrial fibrillation. So this is from our Southwark um, pathway, which aligns very much with the South London cardiac network pathway as well. Um, and the guidance is actually to aim for a ventricular rate of less than 110 beats per minute if they don't have any symptoms, which is higher than I would have done up until uh, up until the change in the guidance. 
Um, and I think there's, there's a good reason for that, which is the RACE2 study, which basically found that there wasn't any significant difference between patients who had strict control or lenient control on um, death from cardiac causes, hospitalization, embolism, or arrhythmic events um, in, in a kind of three year follow up period. So that's for me was quite a practice changing um, approach to say that actually there's there's good reason not to be um, bringing their, these patients rate down um, below 110 beats per minute. And then obviously the mainstay of what we do for patients with AF is anticoagulation. And um, so this um, this is a, another page from our guidance and it shows the um, risk um, percentage from a study in terms of your CHADSVASC risk score in terms of stroke risk and also the risk of a major bleed um, based on the HASBLED score. And in terms of the CHADSVASC score, um, for those of you who are using EMIS, um, EMIS will now calculate that Chad's VASC score for you. Um, for those of you who aren't using EMIS, um, you can also use the MD Calc Chad's VASC calculator um, or other systems. Um, some systems do have this um, inbuilt, but EMIS is the system that I'm familiar with in Southwark and in most of southeast London as well. And so if we anticoagulate these patients with CHASVAS scores of two or above, for patients with a CHASVAS score of two, um, per thousand people with AF, we prevent um, 17 strokes per year. And for a CHASVAS score of five, we prevent 57 strokes per year um, for every thousand patients that we anticoagulate. Um, so I think that's just really important to bear in mind um, that actually that's quite a high rate of stroke prevention and then the um, ongoing disability that could, could result from that as well. So this is the first bit of change um, from the NICE guidelines, um, which is that NICE is moving away now from the has bled score towards the orbit score. Um, and so this was released in the NICE guidelines this morning. Um, but what they have said is that in the meantime, whilst our clinical systems are being updated to include the orbit score, it's still acceptable to use the has bled score. So I think it's a watch this space. Um, while we're while we're waiting for our clinical systems to update. But the reason for using the orbit score is because it's felt to be better at predicting the risk of um, a major bleed um, in people who are anticoagulated. NICE is also clear that we should be using DOAX as our first line in the vast majority of patients. And they've added this, um, this statement which says that for the vast majority of people, um, benefit of anticoagulation outweighs the bleeding risk. And in people who have an increased risk of bleeding, that doesn't necessarily mean that they should not be prescribed anticoagulation, but actually that the risk should be carefully balanced um, uh, before the decision is made. So I think it's just another one of those things where we might find that a patient has a high risk of bleeding, but actually can we mitigate some of those risk factors like blood pressure that's uncontrolled so that we can actually um, get that patient safely on anticoagulation as well. A lot of questions um, about renal function and DOAX, um, and I think most people are now aware that we shouldn't be using EGFR and that we should be using the Cockcroft Galt equation. Um, that's now available in EMIS and I think also on System 1 as well. Um, and you can refer to the South London Creatinine Clearance Information Sheet as well. But I did find this very helpful table, which will also go into the next version of our, our Southwark guide, um, which just shows the, um, the DOAX and their doses um, according to renal function and when you would consider reducing the dose of the DOAX. Um, and this is from UCLP, but I thought it was a really, really helpful summary table. And I put the link in there as well in case people want to um, visit that at another time. And some of you may have noticed um, this pop up box that now comes up on EMIS with the AF anticoagulation advisor. I think this is quite helpful um, and shows you the patient's Chad's FAST score if you hover over it, the HASBLED score, and also their current estimated creatinine clearance, and shows you importantly when the last weight and um, creatinine entry 
um, R, which it's calculated that creatinine clearance on. And then it goes through and also shows you if the patient's been exception reported, if there are any cautions, and if they might be on more than one anticoagulant at the moment as well. And if you double click on it, it will actually open a template which gives you a significant amount of further information as well. So just something to be aware of and something that we can use. And additionally, um, it will um, now, EMIS will tell you if monitoring is advised, it will tell you what the monitoring bloods that are out of date um, are as well. So a safety feature there that's been built in. Quick bit on antiplatelets and AF. Um, so I'm sure most people are aware now that there's no evidence of benefit for antiplatelet monotherapy. There was a really helpful um, diagram in the um, BMJ as part of an article on combining antiplatelets and anticoagulants. Um, and so I'd kind of, this is my go-to when I'm thinking, should this patient be on an antiplatelet as well as their anticoagulant? This is my go-to for the guidance on that. And I find that quite helpful. So just um, directing in there. And then finally, um, NICE have added a little bit about stopping anticoagulation, which I know for, for me has often been one where I've not been entirely sure about um, what to do. And they've recommended that in people with a diagnosis of atrial fibrillation, not to stop anticoagulation solely because atrial fibrillation is no longer detectable. And to actually base those decisions on um, a reassessment of the stroke and bleeding risk using the chads vasc and Orbit scores rather than just um, um, stopping it on the basis that they are no longer in atrial fibrillation. And so that's all from me, a whistle stop tour through the updates in atrial fibrillation. Um, I don't know, Sally Ann, if we've got a moment for any questions. Um, I think I've run through that reasonably to time. Uh, thank you very much, Pai. I'm really clear um, and amazing to have the, um, the revised NICE guidelines hot off, hot off the press. Um, so we've had a question in the in the chat saying, could we include a link to the South East London AF guidelines? And we can certainly do that. Um, I think we've got a minute. If anybody's got another question, if anyone's got a question they'd like to ask Pai Am before we move on. And we've also got Helen here as well. Clearly, clearly, well, clearly it was very, it's so comprehensive, no questions to be asked. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thank you very much, Payam. That's absolutely fantastic. Um, I'd you. like to now move on to Joe and Jess. Hi there. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Joe Mayhew. I am a GP in Southwark and like Payam, I am one of the clinical leads for the clinical effectiveness team in Southwark. Um, and we've got some time now to talk about heart failure uh, and I'm very pleased to be joined by Jess Webb who's a consultant cardiologist in Guys and St Thomas's Hospital um, and we're going to have a little chat really try and keep it interesting try and mix things up a bit and talk about kind of the current state of play in heart failure services if there's any anything that we should be aware of in the community and if there's anything on the horizon so thanks for joining us Jess hi hi there um Hope you can all hear me. Thanks for logging in. Lots of faces and names I recognise, so thank you. So um, I should mention, by the way, I'm not Sandra. I am Joe, despite what Microsoft Teams thinks. So um, Jess, um, so can you tell us a little bit about how heart failure services are organised at the moment, how, how COVID's affected things, and anything we should be aware of from that point of view, please? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. Uh, the last year has been busy for all of us. Um, but the kind of headline news is hot failure services are very much open and it's very much business as usual. Over the last year, we've seen a lot of our COVID, a lot of our hot failure patients get very sick and they've seriously been impacted by how COVID has disrupted care. We've seen that patients have presented later, they've been sicker when they come in, and we've had worse outcomes. And actually, our colleagues at King's have just published this data because it's Lots of the trusts have seen the same thing. We're getting sicker patients, fewer admissions, and more inpatient mortality, which we're all finding very hard. And so really the message is that to continue to get better patient outcomes, we need to continue having an early diagnosis, getting the patients onto the right medications, and ensuring we're up titrating in the community and accessing the specialist services 
that we need. So breaking that down, referrals are much the same across KHP, so across GSCT and King's. We consult and triage, which means we as consultants look at every single referral that comes into the heart failure services. We need an NT Pro BMP so we can triage appropriately. So if the NT Pro BMP is over 2000, then we offer the patient an appointment within two weeks with an echo on the same day. If the NT Pro BMP is between 400 and 2000, we see the patient within six weeks. Please don't try and get an echo beforehand because actually conversely, it slows everything down as opposed to speeding things up. It means that patients wait for an echo and then wait for you to see the result and then the patient gets re-referred. So please just, if you think the patient has clinical signs and symptoms of heart failure and a raised NT Pro BMP, please put the referral in as normal um, and we will make sure they get seen within the appropriate time. Is there any, ever any indication for us to do an echo in primary care? For this, I mean, obviously there are indications for echo in primary care, but in heart failure... Sorry, I, I, meant, I meant heart failure specifically. Yeah, yeah. no. So okay. um, we monitor, we have access to echoes. You know, we have uh, diagnostics when we have patients and we can monitor that. So I can't really think of a situation where we'd be asking you to organise the echo. And if you're uncertain, just give us a shout on Consultant Connect. Okay. And am I right in thinking that both Guys and St Thomas's and King's um, will triage a referral to elderly care um, within that service? Sorry, I should have said actually, you're absolutely right. So we work very closely. We have really good heart failure care of the elderly teams at both sides. If you refer to the heart failure team and it's a patient who we think would benefit from care of the elderly input, we will organise that. So please just refer as normal with the NT Pro BMP, don't bother about an echo. And I guess my last thing is, and it's not specific for Southwark, write down the units of the NT Pro BMP, because I, some labs do a slightly different unit, and it sounds pedantic, but the levels are slightly different. So it's 2,000 or 400 to 2,000 for picograms per mil, which is relevant for us. I think it's worth mentioning that on TQuest, if people are using TQuest on EMIS, NT Pro BMP is BNP. That um, so if you search BMP, that that is an NT Pro BMP, um, and also people are referring on ERS. Um, so if the NT Pro BMP or BNP is over two thousand, mark that as an urgent referral, and if it's above four hundred but below two thousand, just mark that as a as a routine referral. Um, although as as Jess says, all, all those um, referrals are being triaged anyway, so hopefully they'll get to the right place eventually. Uh, I, I just like to say that. As a, as a GP, I love I love it when I send something in and it's triage. It makes it so much simpler from our point of view. We can just send everything to one place with our concerns, and then and then you decide where where to see people. So that that's great. Um, I'm really glad to hear that kind of everything's still up and running, and you want us to do things the same. Um, given that kind of the health service in general is is so busy, is is there anything in particular that you would like primary care to be doing? Is there anything we should be doing for our patients, or anything we can be doing to kind of help help out the community heart failure teams? Um, I think just continue doing all the good work you're doing. Um, you know, I think COVID has really demonstrated how we need to work better together. And certainly during the last year, there have been multiple times where you know, I phoned up a GP and said, hey, you know, let's do this. And you know, please feel free to contact us if you're uncertain, you have concerns. Um, we know that patients with HEFREF, so we're talking HEFREF, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So that's symptoms and signs of the heart failure, an NT pro BMP that's elevated an echo function that shows the heart is severely impaired, that these patients do better on an eight inhibitor or an ARB, a beta blocker, and an MRA such as spiro and perinone, or a perinone. And we start these medications at low dose, and we then up titrate. And we do that because we know that patients do better at higher doses. Now, each patient will get to a point where we can't up titrate further. So if their heart rate's very low, and you may see in our letters, unable to up-titrate further is medically optimised. So either the blood pressure, the heart rate, the renal function of potassium may be stopping us. And we will say this patient is optimised as much as that person can be. But for most patients, we start at low dose and we need to kind of make sure that every patient contact you know, counts. And so if you can optimise and help us with optimisation, that would be fantastic. Um, I want to link in to uh, the heart failure 
uh, guidelines. So I'm just going to share my screen. So keep talking, Joe, while I just organise this. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's something that, that GPs and primary care are sometimes a little bit nervous on in terms of up titrating. Um, I think the, the guidance that, that Jess is trying to share, which is the clinical effectiveness guidance, does kind of give some kind of tips and and uh, kind of help with up titrating. But I don't think the numbers are kind of necessarily always set in stone. You know, there's lots of kind of um, caveats and, you know, if symptomatic or as, as much as possible. But, but generally, the advice from heart failure services seems to be that we can push people relatively far and probably further than we would normally do in GP. So for instance, an acceptable limit for systolic blood pressure would be 90 millimeters of mercury, which is probably a bit sporting compared to what most GPs would be happy to do. I think if you go, it's on about page four of the guidance where it, where it talks about that, Jess. Yes, yeah. Well, can you guys see the guidance? Yeah. Perfect. Um, so. Joe contributed, wrote these guidance, this guidance, and I think it's fantastic. I, I love it because it makes it very clear. And on page two, it very clearly kind of says, why is this a problem for our local patients? Um, we have a number of patients we know that we're not accessing, a number of patients we know who could be on better treatment, and patients are admitted to hospital because they decompensate. And this point about place of death at the bottom on the uh, right really demonstrates that actually we have an opportunity to kind of have these discussions to make patients with heart failure have better outcomes. Um, so I'm just scrolling through. We will link this in the chat. Um, it's very clear. In that we're just talking about parameters for systolic blood pressure. That's quite useful um, to know. From my point of view, if I'm worried about blood pressure, I you know, make sure the patient's symptomatic with it. Um, and you know, if they have postural hypertension or they are struggling, then you know, don't continue to up titrate, ask for help. And um, there's management of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, preserved ejection fraction. I love this bit here at the bottom because it's got all the contact details and it's the, the people that you need to speak to, you know, practically to get the advice you need. Um, some general uh -huh. advice here, but I wanted to share this, which is kind of, you know, what to do if the patient has a cough, what to do if you have a low blood pressure. And this guidance is all out there. And please use it and let us know uh, if you have any questions. I mean, something that's changed in my practice since since becoming involved in this guidance is I'm much more willing to kind of email the heart failure team and say, um, I'm not sure about this. And, and that's often a kind of quicker and easier way. Sometimes they say, oh, we'll just go out and see them and sometimes comes back um, with an answer. So, that, so that's really helpful. And I think kind of trying to keep communications open is always a good thing. Can I talk about Entresto? So Entresto is something that uh, will be on the next version of the guidelines and we're using much more frequently. So it's instead of an ACE, it's instead of an ARB. Patients shouldn't be on Entresto plus an ACE. Okay, so it's instead of. The data is very clear. It makes patients, uh, reduces events, cardiovascular events in 20% um, of patients. So it results in good outcomes for patients. And we typically prescribe it for three months and then we'll hand over the prescription to you. It comes with a few different names. It can be a bit confusing. It's called Entresto, Sucubital Valsartan, or even an Arnie. Um, I think, Joe, you were saying on your system it comes up as SAC, SAC Val, is that correct? Yeah, Sucubitan yes. Valsartan, I think it comes up as on, on EMIS systems. Um, but it's, it's referred to in letters normally as Entresto, isn't it? Yes, um, so that's going to be on the new version of the guidelines. And I guess the other thing to discuss, um, I see that time is escaping us, is that SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, the data is very clear that this is a diabetic medication that had excellent outcome data for patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So that's patients with heart failure without diabetes the first time we're giving this medication, it's very easy to start and it was approved by NICE early in the year and you will see much more of that. It's a once a day 10 milligrams, there's no up titration and it works to get the glucose out of your, um, into your urine, reduces your blood pressure, improves um, glycemic control in diabetics. It's being used, you guys are more familiar with with it than we are because you've been managing it for so many years in diabetic patients but for the first time ever you will see it in patients with heart failure with reduced injection fraction 
in patients who are not diabetic. So let me just make sure I've got this straight. So Entresto, that's a Cubitran Valsartan. That's a medication that I think we are kind of starting to see in primary care yes. a little bit. And then there's the Dapagliflozin. That's exactly how you say it. And no, yeah. everyone's always nervous. Dapagliflozin. I'll, yep. I'll put it in the chat because it's hard to say. Uh, and that's a uh, traditionally diabetic medication, but which is now being used in non-diabetic patients to treat their heart failure. So that's something that primary care can expect to see coming on, on letters and, and things like that. Yes, and we're working, we um, are working across site with the Brompton, with uh, Kings, uh, and there's a patient leaflet that we're coming through and we're saying to patients, you know, this is a diabetic medication you would be given, you are not diabetic, but we're using it for your heart failure. So just to make sure, you know, this is going to become much more common in uh, this year. You'll be seeing patients coming out of hospital from recent inpatient admissions with DAPA, when they're coming to their face-to-face -face clinics, it's likely they'll, that will be added. I, I think over the next few months, you'll see more and more cases of this. Okay. Um, just something that's coming to my head during this chat. Um, for, for those of you in primary care GPs, you might not be aware, but there was, there's a kind of slightly strange heart failure coding issue um, on EMIS and in COF that might mean that some of your patients are, are not included in the COF registers. I'll put a link in the chat. It's it's Southwark guidance, but most of it will be relevant across South East London. Um, that's something that if if you're involved in your heart failure registers, it'd be worth having a having a look at that document. Um, there's a few um, questions in the chat, Jess. I'm, I'm aware that we're out of time, and I see that Dan Zedos. Can I answer the DAPA question, which has just come in, which is yes, it reduces deaths, it reduces um, patient symptoms, it reduces cardiovascular outcome. Um, events in the studies so it, it makes people feel better and live longer so DAPA is certainly something we should be prescribing and thank you to everyone for supporting that. Lovely. I oh, didn't yeah. see the other questions actually, I think uh, be helping us. <laughs> yes yeah we've got some helpers in the background and um, thanks very much that, that was really interesting from my point of view I hope that I hope that was a kind of good update on, on where services are um, uh, uh, across the PAP so it's, thanks very much Jess and I'll, and I'll hand you back to the, um, the team now. Thank you so much, Joe. Thank you, everyone. Oh, well, thank you, Joe and Jess. Really lovely conversation with, again, lots of really useful information. And thank you, Dan, for answering the questions as well. Really good team effort there. Um, so I would, so I would, actually, I think we've got another minute. If anyone's got one question for, for Jess before we move on to Dan. So I didn't have any questions about her today, Dan. What, what did they ask you? I only asked one question. The, the question was about whether we can stop diuretics in heart failure patients, uh, to which I replied, it, it depends on a whole number of circumstances, but uh, sometimes yes. Uh, if a patient's quite motivated, small dose, haven't had repeated issues with fluid retention, um, and happy to do daily weights, because I think that for me is the key with this. If they're, if they're quite a motivated patient and can do daily weights, then um, generally I'm supportive uh, if they've been on a low dose and generally been an uncompensated. Uh, patient. Good, so there's a question about sildenafil and right heart function. So um, in the context of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, we're not using that per se. I mean, we could talk about right heart function. Would that be something people would like to talk about in the next kind of session? I think, Jess, you know, in, in the interest of, of timing, as you say, that, that might be something to pick up next time. And I think um, I think it'd be really useful to do another session like this in, in, a, in a couple more months, again, as things move on and with, with the new therapists coming online. And as we move more out of, you know, out of COVID recovery into business as usual, I think we could do another session. Well, so, I'm more than happy for you to send me an email if you want, but I will sign off. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jess and Joe again. And I will hand over to Dan. Thank you very much. And thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak. I'm just going to screen share, hopefully. Right. Are you, are you seeing a PowerPoint? I can't hear you, Sally. Are you seeing a PowerPoint? Yes, <laughs> no, yes. Okay, good, 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 good. Right, and let me just get. So what I'm going to do, so from my name is Dan I'm a cardiologist at King's College Hospital. So we're going to do a talk on uh, ECG interpretation. 
it's quite interactive. Um, I don't know how this is going to work, but previously I've done this on Zoom with built-in uh, polling, which makes it a little bit easier. Um, I don't have to do that on Teams. And so what I'm using here is something called Vivox, which you can download as an app on your phone. And so often I know in the past when we've done this at one of the national conferences I was speaking at, uh, people were uh, generally asked sort of said, well, try and watch the talk on the laptop and uh, you can do the polling on your on your mobile phone. But it's entirely up to you. You can also do it online uh, and hopefully you've been sent a link uh, for this. So I'm going to go through the basic principles of probably DCG uh, and how you can interpret it in a practical way, show lots of examples uh, and also do a little bit about halter and monitoring. And the reason for this is because um, when I originally was asked to do the talk, I asked various people, what do you think, uh, what do you think should go into this talk? Uh, and in fact, some of that's from a previous version. In fact, uh, Joe very kindly sent the thing, sent that whole to monitor result and said, what should I do with this? <laughs> uh, and so we will talk about that directly uh, through the talk. So first problem with ECGs is that sometimes they necessitate dealing with people like me uh, in cardiology. Some of you may use doctors.net, was an old chat forum uh, that some of us still use. Uh, sometimes you get a bit of primary versus secondary care debate, uh, for want of a better way of putting it, that sometimes can be a bit feisty uh, about GPs getting annoyed with hospital doctors and vice versa. This was one, it's about a year old now this, uh, there's a post by a GP on the chat forum regarding a phone call between uh, the GP uh, and an obstructive cardiology SBR, and it was clearly not a very pleasant experience, probably for either party. Uh, the reply to it, the next person replied to it said, being a complete bell end and liking pink shirts needs to correlate highly with a career in cardiology. Not always try like pink shirts when I went into orthopedics, somebody replied. I don't understand the arrogance of some cardiologists. At the end of the day, many of them are just simply becoming second-rate interventional radiologists who can only do one organ. I found that one particularly <laughs> unpleasant. So it uh, owns no pink shirt. Actually, I wrote this a year ago and I do own one pink shirt now. So that is not entirely true. I'm not an interventional radiologist, but I'm a quasi-radiologist because I do a lot of MRI scanning. And not infrequently, I am called a bell end uh, by my wife, and it's usually when the kids are going mad because, of course, that will always be my fault. So, the first question on the poll uh, is Who is this man? And for those of you who are not going to do the, the poll's open, so any of you who've got access to VBOX can fill this in. Any of you who can't see, the options were number one, Boris Johnson, number two, Matt Hancock, number three, Florentino Perez. Number four, Ryan Mason, and number five, Willem Eintervin. So I'll just give you a few seconds to fill that in. Let's see what you think. So everybody went for the right answer, which is Willem Eintervin. The other four people, uh, were people I've sort of off the top of my head who I thought might not have a job by the end of the year. So Boris and Matt are clearly in a bit of a mess at the moment. Uh, for those of you who don't follow football, Florentino Perez is the Madrid manager who started off the Super League uh, concept last week. Uh, and Ryan Mason is the Tottenham manager and we just lost the final uh, over the weekend. So he is not in a good place. Okay, so Eintervin manufactured the first UCC machine and won a Nobel Prize for it in 1924. And that is what it looked like. Can you imagine having that in your GP surgery or indeed in a hospital? And imagine having multiple of them in a the hospital. You know, if you needed, uh, you know, 10 machines, you need a whole room just for, um, for the equipment. And of course, we're very lucky that things have moved on now such that you can actually, of course, do an ECG if you want to single these. You can just do it on your mobile phone now. The world's changed. And of course, we're also lucky because computers can try and help you, but you've got to be a little bit careful. This was also posted actually on doctors.net uh, as uh, an interesting ECG. And there were various replies from cardiologists, it's on the cardiologist platform, but actually the most interesting reply was from a GP and so who said, actually noticed the most interesting finding on this ECG is that the computer thinks it's normal. So clearly the computer algorithm has completely missed the abnormality here. And the point of showing this is just that the computer can help you and many of you will use it, but you've just got to be a little bit cautious. And I have another example of where it can cause problems a bit later on, uh, which is more current. This is an old ECG. Question two, what do you 
what is the diagnosis here? Let me open up the poll for those of you who want to do it. Uh, okay, so the options are for those of you who are not doing the poll. The first option is acute inferior myocardial infarction. The second is inferior left ventricular aneurysm. The third, complete uh, anterior, uh, uh, sorry, acute inferior myocardial infarction with complete heart block. The fourth is not sure, and the fifth option is myopericarditis. So I'm just going to give it maybe another few seconds. And what we see is 33% of you not sure, 33% acute inferior MI with complete heart block, 16% LV aneurysm, and 16% for a myocardial, inferior myocardial infarct. The right answer to this question, in my view, actually is not sure. There's a number of things this could be. And the reason I show this is because what the key bit of this is what you want is a bit of history. Has this patient presented with acute central chest pain, sounding like a myocardial infarct? Or is this just a routine ECG done in general practice, actually, in a patient who's otherwise completely well, who might have had an infarct in the past? So the changes you see could be the result of an old infarct leading to an inferior aneurysm. So you can see ST elevation here. I don't know whether you'll see my pointer, but in Q3 and AVF, you have ST elevation in Q waves. Um, that could be chronic. So we occasionally see this as chronic changes if you've got an aneurysm. There is also complete heart block on this ECG. So if you look at the rhythm strip at the bottom, see a lot of P waves. Well, I'm stuck in there. This is complete heart block with whatever the problem is. So it all depends on the story. It could be myopericarditis. If the patient's 20 year old come in with very sharp uh, chest pain on the back of a viral illness, actually, this could all be myopericarditis. So the history is key. You can't really answer the question without knowing the history here. Which moves on to the next one. And this is the next poll, which I will just open up for you. Is this ECG normal? And there are three choices. Yes, no, and not sure. Let's see what you think of this one. So just give it another few seconds. What we see with this is 50% of you say it's not normal. 17% say it is normal and 33% say not sure. The owner of this ECG is Mo Farah, who's allowed this ECG to be used. And so, of course, hopefully it, it is actually normal. But you can't say. So the answer to this question really was not sure because it depends on the history. T-wave inversion V1 could be a normal variant. V2, V3, these these T waves and ST do not look normal. This is a very odd ECG. It's got voltage criteria for left ventricular hypertrophy with it. In the African-American and Afro-Caribbean population who are elite athletes, you sometimes see T wave changes in V1 to V4, and that's why the history here is so important. On its own, this ECG could be normal um, if it is that patient. If that's a Caucasian athlete, that's not a normal ECG. So it all depends on the background here. The reason I put this ECG in is because to a South London group of uh, general practitioners, of course, if you're going to do uh, ECGs in the practice in younger, fitter patients, of course, some of them will be African-American, Afro-Caribbean by background. This could be a normal ECG. You can't say. Uh, we'd often end up doing a bit more with this, and we may find nothing at all. So we might do an echo on this and find nothing at all. As I say, it's a known variant in uh, that ethnicity of patients who are, if, if they are elite uh, athletes. So as I say, we think about 10% of African-American athletes get anterior T-wave inversion. So other things you might see in athletic heart, sinus bradycardia, very common, first degree heart block, and even wanky back, actually quite common in younger, fitter people. So the key message for the first bit, think about the clinical context, be careful with computer interpretations and don't, don't rush this in ECG. There's often quite a lot to take in. So I made you rush uh, just because the talk is limited to time. So think about a quick bit about basics. So P wave is your atrial depolarization, QRS is your ventricular depolarization, and T wave is your ventricular repolarization. 
you have normal values for this, of which the one that often causes the most interest is the QT interval, which should be less than 450 corrected in men and 470 in women. As a rule of thumb, if you look at the distance between the two R waves here, the T wave should finish before halfway between the RR interval. So halfway between is here and you see the T waves finish well before. That's what should happen. If it finishes beyond, it is likely the QT interval will be prolonged. So here you have an example of QT prolongation. You see the T wave is still going here halfway through and finishes all the way over here. That is prolonged QT. So this is how I go through an ECG. You're all welcome to have a copy of this talk if you want this, if it's any help to you. I look at the patient's history. Is it the right ECG for the right patient? Um, once a year in A&E, you'll end up acting on the wrong ECG for the wrong patient, uh, which of course is a complete disaster. So is it the right ECG? What's the background? Then I look at the heart rate. Most machines will give it to you and they'll usually do it right. The machine will usually be good for this. If you really want to do it yourself, you can count the QRS complexes and multiply it by six on your rhythm script uh, because it's done over 10 seconds. Have the leads been attached correctly? So you should see a P wave and a T wave inverted in lead AVR because it looks at everything backwards. If not, think about if there a problem here with where the leads have been put. Look at the QRS axis. I won't go into that in detail uh, today just because there's only uh, so much time we have, but the machine will often give it to you. A rule of thumb, if QRS, if QRS is pointing down in lead two, uh, you're likely to be predominantly left axis. If it's pointing down in lead one, it's right axis. So predominant QRS will be pointing up in both those leads when the axis is normal. Look at the P waves. Are they there? Are they associated with QRS? Um, uh, often you're going to best see them in lead two uh, or B1. Look at the PR interval. Again, the machine will usually do it for you and usually be pretty good with it. QRSs, are they big? Uh, and how broad are they? ST segments, are they up or down? T waves, any T wave inversion? Uh, and then the QT interval. In terms of normal variants to look out for, we talked about a bit about athletic heart. You will commonly see T wave inversion in lead three, B1, and you should expect to see it in ABR. That's all the normal stuff. What about abnormal? So this is question four on the poll. This was a 24 hour tape uh, that you're seeing done here of a patient who uh, had had collapses. And I remember actually this was done when I was a registrar. This got put on my desk uh, from a physiologist saying this patient just dropped off the tape that I've had a look at and this is what we see. Uh, what should we do? So the question is, what is the rhythm uh, that you are seeing on this 24 hour tape? And let me just open the poll up. So the options that you're going to have with this are, is it supraventricular tachycardia with aberrant conduction? Is it VF? Is it polymorphic VT? Or is it monomorphic VT? So just give a little bit more time. So two thirds of you went for polymorphic VT and one third went for SVT with aberrancy. You look at, not so easy to see here. If you look at this, this almost looks like VF, but it's a bit too organized. And people often talk about polymorphic VT, which is what this is, is looking reasonably sort of a bit too regular for VF. And it almost looks like the ECG, the curators are wrapping around uh, the baseline here. Um, and that is what polymorphic VT looks like. You see the machine thinks it's VF. Um, this is polymorphic VT, and this woman had a prolonged QT interval, and that was the problem for her. So we actually blue lighted her uh, into hospital with this. I mean, that's a life threatening problem uh, that you're seeing there. The two are blue lighted in. So this is the issue with prolonged QT interval. There's obviously a risk of polymorphic VT um, with it. And as you all know, the predominant issue is often there's a bit of a genetic push in some individuals, sometimes a major genetic push, although that's rare. Electrolyte disturbance won't help matters. And then, of course, often there are drugs that push the agenda. So erythromycin, erythromycin, and then, of course, in combining those with antipsychotics is often a problem. So a whole number of things that you may prescribe in general practice, you've just got to be a bit careful with. And, of course, I know your prescribing systems will often help you with this and say to you, oh, you might want to note this patient's on haloperidol. Do you really want to give them fluconazole or whatever? Uh, so at least it let you to it. And of course, many patients can have more than one QT prolonging agent and be absolutely fine. 
Um, so, you know, it's not an absolute contraindication and if there's good reason to give the drug. It's just a, a warning to you. You might want to have a look at the QT interval if you're going to do that. If you're going to combine QT prolonging agents. And you've got to be careful. So here is the most famous GP in my life, my dad, uh, who's still working at uh, he's nearly 71 now, uh, semi-retired north of the river uh, in Watford. Uh, and all that money he invested in my education came uh, to use to him here, where he sent me this ECD and said, what do you think about this? This was a patient who'd been started on causal pain. And the machine has said the QT is 500, whoops, is 554. Uh, and so dad quite rightly freaked out and thought, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? Psychiatry quite rightly freaked out. Oh my goodness, what are we going to do? And of course, the answer to this was relax and repeat the ECG. So if you look at the problem, I don't quite know why the machine's got it wrong. My suspicion is because of artifacts on the leads here. It's a complete mess over here. If you actually look at over here, think about what I said to you about RR interval and halfway down. The QT, the T wave's ending well before that. And in fact, when we repeated the ECG, it's just clearly normal. So the computers have got this wrong, I think, because of the artifacts. So as I say, you need to have a good look at it. Look at what the machine tells you, but have a good look at it and just make sure that you agree with what the machine says. Okay, quick break about bradycardia. Sinoatrial atrial node disease is not particularly common, but if you are uh, going to do heart rate monitors, what you will generally see on a heart rate monitor is sinus arrest. So here you see a P, a QRS, and a T, P, QRS, P, and then just nothing. So the sinoatrial atrial node just didn't fire here. Patients with this will often find they get breathless walking uphill, for example, where they want a high, faster heart rate, the sinoatrial atrial will know, won't give it to them. This on its own is not a life-threatening problem. Uh, it's an irritation more than that, although it's often associated with atrial infection and no disease in the end as well. AV no disease can be normal, or AV block can be normal. So first degree AV block and wanky back is very commonly seen on heart rate monitors in young people. So if you're going to do whole monitors on young people, you will see this normal variant. As you start to get older, so if my dad had Wenke back, age 70, that's not normal. Much more likely he's got significant AV block. Two to one and complete heart block are not normal in anyone. If you've got those, there is something has happened that's untoward. So the next question on uh, VBOX is, here's a patient who's presented to the general practitioner with syncope. What would you do having seen this ECG? And the options, just as I load it up, are option one, call me, call the cardiology reg or the cardiology consultant. Option two, call 999. Option three, ask Google. Option four, give some GTN spray. Let's see what we get. Let's just give it another couple of seconds. So, two, oh, I was going to say two thirds, uh, one third split. So, 50 50 split, 50% 50 of you are going to call me, 50% of you are going to call an ambulance. Oh, so there's someone to come in with a late response, so 20% are going to ask Google. <laughs> um, so, what you're seeing on this ECG is complete heart block. If you look at the rhythm strip here, there's P waves, so that the heart rate is very slow, it's about 30. There's P waves here that are completely dissociated from the QRS complexes. And the escape, the QRS escape is very broad. This is a life-threatening problem uh, that needs not to be in a GP surgery. This needs to be an A&E ASAP. In fact, it needs to be out of A&E ASAP. It needs to, this, this is going to be, I mean, we'll often give patients like this atropine and it will do nothing. This is a really quite severe uh, disease when you see this. These patients will often end up compromised and this patient has already had a faint. So this is sort of patient that just needs temporary pasting or permanent pasting, ideally straight away, unless there's a really good reason to temporary paste. Actually, ideally, you just put a permanent pacemaker into this. Either way, you need to do something that's going to have an impact on that rhythm and atropine almost certainly, which is what we try first up, almost certainly won't work. Sometimes we can try other things that can prolong things a little bit, but in the end, you're going to need some sort of pasting ASAP uh, with this. Okay, so... Let's move on to Joe's 24 hour tape. So, ectopics, recent onset of breathlessness on exercise, palpitations on 24 hours to G, sinus rhythm through the recording, 116 multifocal VEs, 100 SVE, superventricular ectopics, 5 SVE couplets, uh, mean heart rate 75, max 115, no symptoms on virus G. 
Topic, topics can be atrial, uh, they're often narrow, uh, if, you see them, if you see that, or ventricular, uh, so of course then they will be broad. They can be monomorphic, where they all look the same, so they might all look like this ectopic here, or they may be polymorphic, which is what you see in this case, where they look completely different. If they're polymorphic, it means that the ectopics, the electrical uh, stimulus has come from a different bit of the ventricle here, it's probably a different ventricle, one from the right, one from the left ventricle. You may see them randomly, or they can appear in patterns. So what you see here is normal QRS ectopic, normal ectopic, normal ectopic, that we call by Gemini. And if you get a run of them, we would call that non-sustained ventricular cardia. So three or more is non-sustained VT. We often see small numbers of ectopics on halter monitors. It's extremely common in patients who've got no overt heart disease. They can cause symptoms, and they can, if you have an awful lot of them, cause heart failure, which we'll get onto in a second. <clears throat> and if you have an awful lot of them, again, there can be a risk for VT. This was a piece written by two of my electrophysiology colleagues here in a GP journal, which I'll give you a reference for in a minute. Um, isolated ventricular ectopics are seen in 43% of people with normal uh, 12 dd CG. So this is a common, common problem on halters. You will see this in lots of people. Uh, couplets, so two of them are observed in 4%, less than 1% had by Gemini or trigemini. 1% was found to have more than 500 beats in a 24 hour period. So all types of ectomy were more common in people who were older. So you most likely see this in older people who are the most likely to get 24 hour take. Frequent ectopics can cause a reversible cardiomyopathy. So when you're seeing 10 to 20% or more or over a 24 hour period, the patient's at risk of developing heart failure. So, of course, at that point, we are then much more interested in doing something about it. It usually starts with beta blockade, but sometimes ablation. So, as a general thought, in terms of the original uh, comment from Joe, what should you do with this when you see it? If you're seeing an ectopic burden of over 10% of all beats, and they, they should tell you this in the report, if there's a mass load, they'll say to you, the burden is, then we definitely will want to see that patient. <clears throat> you can see from the research that I showed you there, you're starting to see more than 500 a day that starts to become a bit unusual so the patient joe i think was about 120 um so it's much under the 500 so that's much more in the more sort of common uh, area it might be over 500 less common so lots of them equals refer and there's some ballpark numbers you might want to have in mind the patient's very symptomatic you might want to refer so some patients get topics they don't notice some patients get ectopics they really don't like it you can try treating with a beta blocker, and if that doesn't work, potentially then refer on. I think if you're worried about ectopics, you're going to end up obviously wanting to do a 12 lead ECG first up. And in the end, you're going to want to do an echo. You're going to want to prove the heart is structurally normal. So my threshold, I mean, everybody who comes to a cardiology department gets an echo anyway, from our perspective. If I didn't, if I did a halter monitor on somebody who was age 20 and they had three ectopics, I wouldn't do an echo on them. But if it was somebody a little bit older or if the ectopic burden was reasonably high, you then want an echo to make sure the heart is structurally normal. So, of course, if the echo is abnormal with 12 lead ECG, we're going to want to see the patient. If there's something in the history that worries you, I mean, clearly a family history of sudden death is going to be worrying. Such patients may already be seen by cardiology as part of screening uh, or non-sustained VT. So I can't, it's difficult to be exhaustive because, of course, the numbers are obviously very variable, but as ballpark thoughts, that's what I would do with this. So the answer to Joe's question of, do you worry about that halter? On its own, no. Uh, the patient will give you a diary, so you don't know whether the ectopics correlate with the symptoms. But the first thing I would generally do with ectopic, symptoms from ectopics is reassure the patient and say, okay, it's ectopics. They're not going to, there's nothing to worry about. You're not having that many of them. Maybe the reassurance will make it better. If not, if they're really struggling with it, then think about beta blockade. And there's a reference. As I said, anyone who wants this talk is more than happy. I'm more than happy for you to have it. So last bit of this in the last few minutes, uh, the last question here is about an LVH ECG. So this is a young patient with atypical chest pain. What do you think the diagnosis is here? So this is the last poll. And the options that you have on here are normally ECG, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, familial Mediterranean fever, or church strap syndrome. Give you 30 seconds more to have a look at it and do some polling.
the 50-50 split between normal and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. What you're seeing here is bolted criteria for left ventricular hypertrophy, very big QRS complexes. But everything else looks fine. This is normal variant in somebody who's young. You will often see quite large QRS complexes in younger people. On their own, that's not helpful. You'll quite often see it. However, when you see a load of T wave change and ST change with it, that's much more worrying. So this is a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy ECG, where again, you've got the big QRS complexes like you had before. But in this particular case, what you have is a lot of T-wave change. This is a very abnormal ECG. There is no question that there is something wrong with this person's heart. In this case, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This looks like a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy ECG. Sporting T-wave changes. The STs also don't look normal here. So the key thing in general practice, ECGs on younger people, Surely finding big QRS is not helpful. It's the ST and the T wave changes that you want to look for. Okay, so with two minutes to spare, uh, conclusions. Always think about putting the ECG into a clinical context. <clears throat> Make sure it's the right ECG for the right patient. Have a method of looking through and always ask for help uh, if you're not sure. You've obviously got on-call registrar, consultant connect. There's multiple ways that you can try and contact your local cardiology. Uh, services where we can have a look in the course. The beauty is, I mean, if, if you are happy to sharing things, both WhatsApp if they're anonymized, I'm always happy to do. So as long as the name of the patient isn't on the ECG, I'm always happy to that and get opinion straight away or via email, even better. Um, so I hope that's helpful. And that's that. Let me stop sharing. There we go. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, very amusing and very informative. Um, one question just come through. Any advice for atrial ectopic beats? Um, on their own, again, if you're having a shed load of them, again, it's likely. To, what, what you'll find if people are having a lot of them, it means that in the end, they're likely to develop, to develop paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. It's a good warning uh, sign uh, that, that paroxysmal AF is on the horizon. So on its own, if the patient's asymptomatic, unless they were having an awful lot of them, I wouldn't particularly do anything with it. They're less worrying than ventricular ectopics in higher number. Again, it's just telling you, though, that you're probably going to end up seeing a patient who's got issues with AF down the line. And then we've also been asked, can you put the slide of normal abnormals in young people? Can you re-show the slide? Uh... Two seconds to reach there. Uh, what am I looking at here? So I don't want that one. Uh, sorry, me, just give me two seconds just to get it all back up. Oh, there it is. Um, right. So I'm going to. Is which slide you actually meant <laughs> with this because there's a few different bits of that was the normal values one that's what you were looking for the last one are you on the end uh you talking about something like that is that the one you want yes Uh, Dan, I think you said you were happy to circulate these slides. Oh, yeah, yeah, honestly, anybody who wants it, just email me. So my, my email address is all one word, danielsado at nhs.net. No dots um, in my name. So it's just danielsado, one word, at nhs.net. So anyone who wants it, um, just ask. It's no problem. I'm very happy. Other GPs have got it, and I'm very happy for anyone to have it. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm aware of the time. Um, Dan, yeah, thank you. That was a really, really interesting um, um, presentation. Lots of thanks coming through on the chat. I'm just going to hand over very quickly to Rianne just to wrap up. Thanks, Ayanna. Thanks all our presenters. Brilliant and interesting presentations this afternoon. Um, and thanks to all of you for joining us. And we hope you've enjoyed it. I've just popped a survey in the chat 
we'd be really uh, grateful if you could uh, please complete this and just let us know what worked well and what we could improve on for the future um, for our upcoming events. Um, if you don't have time now, it does take about two minutes, but I will be circulating it in an email to you all as well. Um, I will be sending out CPD certificates um, with the your names and email addresses that you registered to the event with. I think a few of you have um, slightly different names on Teams, so if if that's a problem, just put your full name and your email address in the chat, um, and I can add that to the circulation list as well. We have been recording this session, um, so I will send a link to our website where this will be uploaded. Um, so yeah, thanks again, and we hope you enjoy it, and take care.